Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss out. All right. So today we have a wonderful and amazing, super talented, bright, intelligent guest who's been through a lot in her life. And she's turned that into a mission to help each and every one of us to live better, live healthier, get our guts working properly. And she is just a phenomenal soul. We have Rachel Shear with us today on the podcast. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you for having me on, Dr. Thomas. It's an honor to join you today. Oh, uh, the pleasure is mine. I appreciate you so much. We've been kind of connecting back and forth uh, over the last several months, and I've been watching your journey for quite a while. And I just love what you're all about. And mm-hmm. wow. Tell us a little bit about where that came from, how, how you got to where you are and why you decided to uh, pursue this interest in gut health. Yeah, it's like, why gut health, right? Um, And it's a very interesting niche. I got into gut health, I feel like, before gut health was sexy as well online, which now you see everything blowing up on social media about the gut microbiome and everything. So I love that. But way before then, I actually came from more of the fitness world. Um, I always wanted to get into school and to dietetics. Nutrition was something that I always loved because actually I grew up the opposite. I grew up eating fast food, McDonald's, stored Halloween candy, but I was an athlete. I was a gymnast and I was a dancer. So when I went off to college, I was like, well, maybe there's something here with this diet thing that I could really probably perform a lot better with my athletics if I started to eat better. So it was like this crazy thought, you know, I had, but I got went into college and I got into weightlifting because um, I was no longer in dance and gymnastics and I just fell in love with it. And I think for anybody who's ever had fitness be a long part of their life, they'll agree when I say that we don't work out just because of the body. The body's just a byproduct of having six pack abs. Everybody wants to look good naked, of course. But I fell in love with what it really did for my mind. It was this therapy for me. And of course, I started to get stronger and I started to feel more confident in myself and that radiated in all of these other areas of my life. So I fell in love with fitness and I loved it so much that I got into bodybuilding and I decided I wanted to compete and win some trophies and get up on stage and literally be judged for how I looked because that's what you do in bodybuilding. And I won my very first competition I ever did. I took first place. And I think that's what really lit a fire under me. I was incredibly good at it. And I loved all of the byproduct of it. And I think that's what a lot of people find when they get into fitness. They love what it does for them mentally and physically. But to be completely honest, I'm the type of person when I do something, I do it to the extreme. So for me, this has been a blessing in so many areas of my life. It's how I built my business. It's how, you know, I achieved my body composition and I won so many first place trophies and bodybuilding, got on the cover of different magazines like bodybuilding.com, train, but it's also been my downfall in a lot of areas. Mm. too. So I ended up pushing my body to pretty extreme levels. I was at about 8% body fat and I no longer had a menstrual cycle. And I started to really, really struggle mentally with anxiety, depression, and just the pressure that I was putting on myself. And I remember about three years into competing, actually, after I won first place at the Branch Warren Classic, um, I came home and just something felt really, really off internally. And I remember from that day after, my gut was just never the same. I started to get chronically bloated after every time that I would eat, literally looking six months pregnant. Um, I wasn't on any, um, or I should say I was on birth control at the time because of my lack of menstrual cycle, you know, and I started to have all of this pain after every time I would eat. So I did what most people would do. And I went to the doctor, right? (laughs) And they ran some different blood tests. They did, you know, the CT scan, the MRI, and I just was given a label of IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. They said there was nothing structurally wrong. They ruled out anything major, but I was just given medications. So they gave me laxatives so I could use the restroom because at this point now, the motility in my gut had come to a stop. 
um, where I would have to use laxatives or even on some days enemas to just go to the bathroom. And then I was put on thyroid medication because my thyroid now had plummeted along with my lack of menstrual cycle and my hair was falling out. My skin was a wreck. So I felt like there was everything that was off in my body, but here I have these physicians looking at my blood work and saying, Hey, your thyroid's a little bit low, you know, here's a medication, here's birth control for your hormones. Here's some different medications for, you know, going to the bathroom. And I felt like no one was really taking me very seriously. And I continued to get worse and worse and worse where I even went to the Mayo Clinic, did every scan under the sun, which like the Mayo Clinic, right, is like the gold standard supposed to be when it comes to health um, and, and still nothing. So I was eventually then sent to a colorectal surgeon. Now at this point, like my gut issues were so severe where I was using an enema like every single day. And I know not very cute or sexy um, for like a fitness model, a competitor, And they told me the solution was now going to be to actually cut out my entire large intestine. Now, I didn't have anything damaged with my intestine. I didn't have Crohn's. I didn't have ulcerative colitis. I didn't have any of those things. I just had zero motility in my gut. And the thought process was that this is probably something I've always had. It was um, like a floppy colon or, you know, a sluggish colon. And by cutting out the large intestine and sewing the small intestine to the rectum, this would get rid of a lot of the motility issues. And, you know, Dr. Thomas, I was so desperate at that point. And, you know, if anyone's ever been at that point of desperation with their health, they will do anything to just start to feel better again. And I highly considered getting that surgery. I was like, just when do I need to do it? Sign me up. Because for me, it gave me like, maybe this is like this hope of normalcy I'll finally have again. And my whole life up until this point had been athletics. It had been dance. It had been gymnastics. I got into bodybuilding in college. I went to Baylor for nutrition and dietetics. So my whole life now had been revolving around health and wellness and fitness. So I felt literally betrayed by my body at this point. So I was depressed and I just wanted to get on with my life, but I did not get the surgery. Thank goodness you didn't. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness I did not get the surgery, but just like how I became obsessed with, you know, doing everything to the extreme and like the bodybuilding, you know, I became that laser focused and really getting to the root cause of what was really going on with my body. And since a lot of my issues were revolving around my gut, that's when I really started to do a lot of research about the gut and the gut microbiome and how these little microbes in our gut, they're not just dormant. They're actually connected to every system in our entire body from our hormones, our thyroid, our metabolism, of course, the motility and the transit of the food throughout our gastrointestinal tract to our mental health, anxiety, depression, And I remember as I was learning all of this, I was like, why aren't more people talking about this? Why aren't more talking, more people talking about the bacteria in our gut? And this is when I started to do different types of protocols on myself. I did elimination diets, um, coming from the bodybuilding world. I had a lot of, I call it macro friendly foods in my diet. So they were high in protein, you know, and fit it it from like a calorie standpoint in maintaining muscle, but they were not very gut friendly, artificial sweeteners, um, a lot of pre-workouts, protein powders full of gums, artificial sweeteners, and not only just the dietary stress I had on my body, I had a ton of physical stress and I had a ton of mental stress too. So as I really, really dug deeper and deeper and deeper, it made sense. It made sense why my body motility had slowed down from a metabolic standpoint, but also combining diet with stress, why I ended up with all of these microbiome imbalances. And that was really what the root cause was that I came to discover. I had a ton of bacteria overgrowth in my gut, something called SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. I had some intestinal permeability and metabolically, my body had downregulated my thyroid and my hormones as a byproduct. And of course, my mental health was affected and everything was affected. So I wanted to help people really get to their root cause. And 
I was able to eventually heal my own body through a lot of these different approaches. It wasn't overnight, you know, eventually it was like, okay, I could go a few days without pain. Eventually it was like, okay, I went like a few weeks, you know, eventually it was like, oh my gosh, a few months. And I didn't even realize like I had gut issues anymore, but eventually my body did heal. And for me, that was the most freeing thing that I could have ever done for myself of really, really doing the work to heal my body, identify the root cause for more of this holistic standpoint. So it was then when I became certified in functional medicine. And now this is exactly what I do today. I have a team of five registered dietitians and we help people get to the root cause of their health issues and take this gut centric approach to healing. Because just like I said earlier, our gut is literally connected to every system in our entire body. And I know um, your wife, Brooke, um, gut health helped her so much exponentially too with a lot of her own struggles. So I truly believe now when you get the gut right, everything else starts to fall into place. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And it, I mean, it just from the simple, like if we just took it from a numbers perspective, right. At least equal to the numbers of human cells, some studies say maybe 10 times more, but you know, it's some trillions, who knows if it's 30 trillion, 300 trillion, you know, it doesn't even matter, but there's at least as many non-human cells as there are human cells. And then when you look at their actual DNA or their genetic material, the so-called microbiome, they far outnumber us. That's probably 10 times or a hundred times more information than what we have in our our human DNA. So when, when we just kind of step back for a second, we go, okay, these guys not only probably outnumber us, but their genetic material is many times greater than ours. And maybe we should pay attention to these little guys, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we should actually, cause they could be our best allies mm -hmm. or worst foes. I mean, if we don't take care of them, we can suffer from all these things uh, that you mentioned, right? Everything from just not feeling well to having motility issues, to having the, the ones that we, you know, all of us experience, but don't like to talk about all the mental health stuff, the anxiety, the depression, the stress, the, you know, all these things are, are hugely related to the gut. I mean, one of my favorite studies that has been done in the last decade is when they took the fecal transplant, if you will, the microbiota of somebody with a certain mental health disorder, say schizophrenia, for example, which is pretty extreme. And they put that stool, that poop in a mouse that didn't have any of those characteristics. They started to display the characteristics of that really severe psychiatric disease, schizophrenia, because of the gut flora, the actual bacteria that were transplanted. It wasn't, they didn't obviously get human genes. They didn't get anything else. Mm -hmm. Wasn't exposed to a certain stressful situation. It was basically just the gut transplant, the, the, the fecal transplant, right? The poop from the individual that mm -hmm. had this. And that's been done in the other way as well. People have been healed that way that have gotten, you know, healthy fecal transplants, if you will. And, and I'm not advocating fecal transplants, right? That's not the first go-to method. We don't want to have to necessarily go and get somebody's poop to, to change our situation. But like you mentioned, your goal and your team is to help people learn how they can get their gut healthy because it can be done yeah. rather simply. Like what, what's your like startup approach? Do you just tell them, you know, stop eating the processed foods and eat real food? What's kind of like day one? What, what do you first uh, focus on? Is it what to put in or what to subtract or both? Or I think it's a combination of both of, you know, avoiding the things that are damaging the gut and then adding in things that can really help heal the gut and build up a very robust microbiome. You know, they have a ton of studies now out there about, low diversity in our gut, And essentially, you know, diversity is the amount of individual bacteria we have of individual bacterial species in our gut microbiome. And they've shown, you know, connections between low diversity with type two diabetes, high cholesterol, inflammation, autoimmune conditions, hormone issues like PCOS, and then mental health issues, anxiety, depression, but even things like you mentioned, like, um, you know, neurodegenerative disorders, Alzheimer's, dementia, those are all connected to the bacteria that are residing in the gut. So I think for a lot of people, you know, if we can think of the average American that is overweight, obese, and eating the sad diet, the standard American diet, they have a very low diverse microbiome, which leaves them prone to a lot of these other metabolic issues, inflammatory conditions, uh, immune related issues to go along with it. So I think, you know, 
they've, they've even shown in studies in just three days of cleaning up someone's diet. So taking the standard American diet and putting them on a Mediterranean diet that the gut microbiome looked, you know, dramatically different in just three days. So we can change our gut microbiome and the biggest way is truly through the food that we eat because it's not just what we eat. It's really what the bacteria in our gut are eating to go along with it. You know, when you eat an avocado, you're actually eating the microbiome of that avocado and all of these different foods between the fibers, between the carbohydrates, you know, they're feeding different types of bacteria in our gut. But if you can think of the standard American diet, also it's like brown, white, processed foods, inflammatory fats, you know, industrial seed oils, vegetable oils, sugars, you know, these are also feeding bacteria in our gut, but they're not really feeding the good bacteria that we want. They're feeding pathogenic bacteria, they're feeding yeast, um, not good fungi. And this is actually what leads to a lot of these issues like IBS, you know, and all everything that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So I'd say first and foremost is removing a lot of those stressors. So there's three big stressors that can cause the gut to become off. It's dietary stressors, um, environmental stressors, and then emotional stressors. I would say, you know, low hanging fruit for most people is going to be diet and lifestyle and starting there first and foremost, and, you know, working on removing processed foods. It doesn't have to be super complicated. Um, you know, simply put, if it comes in a bag or a box or it has a long list of ingredients, if you're eating the back of, you know, a few item and you don't know what the heck, you know, most of those ingredients are probably not good for your gut bacteria. So by pulling out a lot of those foods that are processed, what does this leave us with? Real whole food, you know? And, you know, for a lot of people listening, this doesn't sound like groundbreaking, but it's, you know, a lot of people don't have this information. You know, I grew up, like I said, eating McDonald's and processed foods and, you know, our bacteria also lead to cravings through our dopamine response quite a bit there too. So, you know, I had all of these cravings for these hyper palatable foods and that's exactly what the food industry wants. It wants us to be addicted to a lot of these foods that wreak havoc on our gut, that wreak havoc on our brain and our weight, you know, to go along with it. So the beginning, it can be a little bit challenging, right? Pulling out these foods because we are addicted. We have that dopamine <laughs> response. Um, but usually within, you know, a few days up to, you know, for some people, a couple of weeks, we start to see that dramatic shift in their gut bacteria and then their taste buds buds change. They start to actually enjoy eating a lot of these real whole foods to go along with it. Now, once we've pulled out some of those, you know, processed foods, that's when we can really focus on adding in. And a way a lot of my clients operate is it's hard to think of the negatives. So I I have to take out these foods. I have to get rid of all my favorite foods. (laughs) But usually when we focus on what they get to eat, you know, that's a much better way for the brain to really, you know, process and focus on. Um, so I always say there's three things we can look at, you know, of course, protein, um, fat carbohydrates, those are the main three macronutrients. So we'll, I'll start first with protein, um, coming from the bodybuilding world. I'm all about protein, but the quality really does matter. So when I was in the bodybuilding world, it was like, just get enough protein. It didn't matter if it was processed or not. Um, processed protein powders, beef jerky, you know, and there's good beef jerky out there. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> the egg whites. Um, did, you make, did you make the egg whites uh, in, your, oh, in yeah. your smoothies and stuff? <laughs> and I had like zero fats, like in any of my diet too. Um, so high carbohydrate, you know, poor quality protein. So the quality of protein really matters. I mean, I know this is something that you t- talk about quite a bit on your social media, but we want to get grass fed and finished ideally with red meat. We want to get wild caught fish. We want to get pasture raised type, you know, chicken, um, eggs if possible. Um, so getting high quality animal protein, um, protein is so essential, not just for muscle mass, but really for a gut. And a lot of people don't realize, but our gut lining is actually a muscle tissue. And we talk a lot about bacteria imbalances in the gut, but something called intestinal permeability is also a really big issue or otherwise known as leaky gut. And when our stress is high or when our diet is really inflammatory, 
what can happen is our gut lining actually begins to break down and we pull something called glutamine out of that gut lining, which L-glutamine is an amino acid that comes from protein. So we need these high quality animal proteins, not just for supporting our muscle tissue um, or or even our brain, because our brain relies on a lot of these amino acids too, but also for keeping the integrity of our gut lining nice and strong and healthy. So protein is first and foremost and quality matters most. Um, Number two is fats, eating an abundance of good anti-inflammatory healthy fats. So we talked a little bit about industrial seed oils, vegetable oils, those inflammatory fats. We want to stay away from those. No bueno, you know, for your gut bugs or your gut lining. Um, But there are fats that we want to have in our diet. So these are omega-3 fatty acids, and these keep inflammation low. They keep our gut lining nice and strong and healthy. Um, it actually helps our body with the proper neurotransmission quite a bit too. So they've even shown connections from a neurological standpoint with low omega-3 fatty acids and depression, anxiety, and mental health issues, but our gut bugs love omega-3 fatty acids too. So most people have heard of omega-3s, but they come from fatty cuts of fish, fish oil, Um, I run testing on people all the time, looking at their omega-3 and omega-6 index. And I'll say about nine out of 10 times, you know, people are high in those pro-inflammatory fats. Uh, The omega-6, yeah. The omega-6s, and they're low in those omega-3 fats. Mm -hmm. And we also see that their gut microbiome is inflamed, um, leaky, and they have those bacteria imbalances. So adding in a lot of those omega-3s are super essential. And then the last is carbohydrates and our gut bugs love carbohydrates. Now the, the bad gut bugs, they love the processed carbohydrates. They love the sugar, you know, they love the crackers, the breads, all that kind of stuff. So we're not talking about those type of carbohydrates. We're talking about prebiotic fibers, the veggies, yeah. the veggies. <laughs> yes. And a lot of people pay prebiotic fibers as a supplement, which is okay but really we should be able to get them from diet. Um, Prebiotic fibers are found in things like asparagus, Brussels sprouts, um, artichokes are actually one of my favorite sources. You'll see that in my salad on my Instagram story almost every day. And these prebiotic fibers, they feed the good gut bugs residing in our gut. And they actually help our gut bugs produce something called a postbiotic. And these postbiotics are really beneficial for our our body, our metabolism, our mental health as a whole. One of the ones that I actually test for quite a bit is something called butyrate. And butyrate is a short chain fatty acid that is very protective to the gut lining. It produces this mucus that coats the gut. It's important for our immune system. And one of the ways we therapeutically can increase levels of butyrate is by eating more prebiotic type fibers. So our our gut bugs love prebiotic fibers. The second one is probiotics. So we've got our prebiotics that are feeding those gut bugs. Number two are probiotics. And I'm all for taking probiotic supplements. I take one myself. They're, They're great for the gut. Um, There's a a lot of studies, though, about uh, probiotics and them not really truly colonizing to the gut, Mm -hmm. Um, but they do still work great. They actually work as natural antimicrobials, so those good probiotics fight off a lot of those bad gut bugs, but I, I think actually eating more fermented type foods is a great way to actually work on that microbiome diversity, so kimchi sauerkraut. Um, some people do yogurt if they can tolerate, you know, way okay. Um, miso pickles. I'm a big pickle fan. So I'll be eating pickles every day. So these <laughs> fermented foods are great for also increasing that diversity with the bacteria that's in our gut. And then the third one that I always try to have people focus on are something called polyphenols. Um, polyphenols are a substance that give fruits and vegetables their bright colors. And this is why if you see, um, you know, my plate, if you were to follow me on Instagram on some of the things that I post, you'll see my plates are very brightly colored. 
I have lots of leafy greens. I have beets. I have purple sweet potatoes. I have carrots. You know, I have tomatoes. I have bright colored bell peppers. I have avocado for those good fats. I have a protein like salmon on there, some of those fermented foods, but these bright colored fruits and vegetables have those polyphenols in there. And polyphenols are great because they work kind of like a probiotic and they can increase a lot of those good bacteria in our gut, um, different strains of bifidobacterium and lactobacillus too. So the more brightly colored fruits and vegetables we have in our diet, uh, the more diverse our microbiome is really going to be. So those are some quick tips that people can start to incorporate. Um, but simply put, cutting out the processed foods, the white and the brown colored foods that we tend to eat, especially if you're eating fast food quite a bit and just really focusing on real whole food and diverse amounts of fruits and vegetables, um, high quality protein and fats. I mean, we'll see dramatic shifts immediately in the gut microbiome. Yeah. Wow. That was, that was literally a gold mine right there. You said yeah. <laughs> so many amazing things. And I just want to give some perspective when you mentioned that, uh, um, a lot of us do tend to eat processed food. So the data suggests that in the U S I'll just speak to that between 50 and 60% of our diet, depending on which study you look at is not only processed food, but ultra processed food. So these are like what you mentioned, the crackers, the chips, the super highly processed breads and all of that stuff like that makes up to 60%. In fact, there was a recent uh, article that was just released in the last six months in the journal of pediatrics, which suggested that kids that number is like 60, I forget what it was, 64%. It was really high of the number of highly processed foods kids are eating. And that just, I got six kids, most of you guys know, and like that really, really sat not so well with me. I was like, oh my gosh, these kids do not have a chance. Like, no wonder they're of course going to be obese and get type two diabetes and have heart disease. And like, something's got to change here. And it's actually super, super simple. I, I love your simple approach. I mean, honestly, there are so many more things that we can, C-A-N, can eat and add to our plate than those that we have to take away. There's only three things really to take away. It's the highly processed grains, you know, the glutens, the flours, and then the sugars, all the high fructose corn syrup, the sweeteners. But the third is the seed oils. Those three things, if we eliminate what I call the evil triad, like, mm -hmm. and eat real food, like it's that simple. Yeah. I mean, there's over 2000 species of edible plants out there. And we as humans eat almost 60% of our diet of four. I'm sure you can all name them, right? Corn, wheat, mm -hmm. soy, and rice. Those four things make up almost 60% of all the calories that we eat out of four plants. And there's literally 2000 edible plants. And if you ever go to a farmer's market and you look at all these different kinds of both, you know, let's say different lettuce or chards or whatever, and, and you look at the fruits that are multicolored, come to Hawaii and you'll see dozens of fruits you've never seen before. Like, what is that thing? Oh, that's a dragon fruit. What is that thing? Oh, lily koi. What is that? And it's, they're colorful. They're beautiful. They, I mean, they almost look like art. You look at them, you're like, wow, that thing is like, I, I could just take a picture of that and hang it on my wall. It looks so darn cool, but they have so many amazing properties and they're so beautiful and so good for you. So they're colorful, they're diverse. And what you said about the diversity of the gut was right on. The more diverse our gut, the healthier we will be. The less diverse or the less number of different species, the less healthy, generally speaking. And the way that we get those guys diverse and healthy is we eat a diverse diet, right? We're telling you to eat sure. more different things. Don't just eat that same stuff, right? Like you said, the white and the brown and the boring colored stuff, let's eat the colorful stuff and it will be so much better for our overall health. Wow. There was so much there that you shared. I, I'm curious, you tell me. So the probiotic foods, there are actually, I just, I just looked at this last night. There's over 6,000 different types of probiotic foods, which are like fermented foods. You know, there's kimchi and sauerkraut, some of the things you mentioned, but there's literally over 6,000 across uh -huh. the different cultures of the world. And I know personally, I've maybe tried a few dozen. So yeah. that's like on my list is to increase the different types of fermented foods that I eat. My favorites right now are kimchi, you know, coming from Hawaii. That's like a staple. We all love kimchi. We love miso. We have miso soup all the time. My kids are huge fans, that kind of stuff. Do you have a favorite in the fermented food department? I'm just curious. I'm pretty basic. I eat this beet sauerkraut probably every single day for lunch on my salad. So I get like a double whammy because I got the beets, the beets and, the yeah. and then I got the sauerkraut too. So that's my favorite. And then pickles, of course, but I haven't mm. branched out a ton. I'm right there with you in that boat. I need to branch out a little bit. I tend to stick to the 
the sauerkraut, the kimchi, and then the pickles most often. Yeah. yeah. I, I love those. And, and I, I haven't yet been making my own. I just, gosh, you know, between the six kids and work and my wife works and we're just always just running. I haven't made my own, but I want to, and I want to learn. I have made my own yogurt. So that's one thing I have tried. Um, and it's actually easier than you think. It doesn't taste quite like the store-bought yogurt, which is fine. Mm. It's kind of like one of those things your kids go, you know, if it tastes a little funny, it's, it's probably good for them, you know? And uh, I, I read, what was that recent book uh, on, um, it talks about lactobacillus, um, uh, which one's the new one that they're talking about? Oh gosh, my mind is going blank. But, but anyway, I read, it, it's by a physician that wrote uh, the recent book on gut health and he gives like, 10 or 12 recipes. So I used a couple of his recipes and I made my own and it was actually, I thought it was kind of cool because it was kind of tangy and it was kind of different. You know, most of the yogurt that you get at the store is only fermented for about four hours. Mm -hmm. So the amount of colony forming units or the amount of, you know, probiotic bacteria in there is so low, super low. But if you ferment your own, usually you ferment it for like 36 hours, maybe 48 hours. So the doubling that occurs, and this is what you spoke to kind of at the beginning is how quickly you could actually change your microbiota, because these guys are literally doubling every couple hours. So you can get the good bugs to proliferate quickly. If you change your diet, well, same thing. If you're making your own yogurt and you let it ferment for like 36 hours, the numbers of these colony forming units is like through the roof. So it's way more effective than just like buying whatever yogurt you can get at the store or kefir or whatever that's processed and probably fermented only for a couple of hours. And so that's one thing I'm kind of experimenting with. I haven't got it all dialed in, but it's, it's kind of fun, you know, to make your own yogurt. And then I I really want to make my own kimchi and my own different pickled vegetables and things like that. That's kind of on my list. So, so many to try so many to try. (laughs) I've actually made the yogurt when I was healing my gut. I followed a few different types of healing protocols, which is a little bit more specific for someone with like major gut issues. And I did the the fully fermented yogurt where there's actually zero lactose left in it because some people who have a ton of bacteria overgrowth, they don't Mm -hmm. tolerate lactose very well because lactose is a fermentable sugar for gut bacteria. But when you would fully ferment the yogurt and getting a good like grass fed type milk and then ferment that, it removed all of the lactose actually from the yogurt. And it was very high, just like you said, in a lot of those probiotics. So I bought like this, like really cool contraption machine. I probably used like three times. <laughs> but, um, it was great. And I actually, I really liked the taste of it, but yeah, sour. Is it's got a little zing to it. Yeah. I like yeah. it too. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun. And you can start with different substrate. You don't even have to start with milk. You can use other things. You can just start with heavy cream. You know, there's all kinds of ways to do it. And it's, it's very, it's, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very fun. It's very fun to do. And it's definitely, I think, uh, got a really nice zingy kind of taste, which personally I, I like sour. So, <laughs> but you don't have to do that. You don't have to take the time to make your own yogurt, just ditch the three, you know, processed food items that we talked about, the sugars, the grains and the seed oil and eat real food and, take care of your body. Um, one thing I want to talk about uh, a little bit with gut health, and I don't know if you've seen this a lot with your clients or in your own uh, life, but what I've noticed, which is super interesting, and I can't exactly articulate why it would be to the extreme that it is, but these bugs that live in us, especially with respect to the gut microbiota, is they respond not only to the food we eat, but they respond to other things too. They respond to what we do, right? They respond to exercise. They respond to what I find super interesting is circadian rhythm. So even though they literally live in the dark, they also respond to the light dark cycles. And I don't know if you've found that to be helpful with your clients and what, what's your experience been with gut health and circadian rhythm? I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, everything that we're doing for ourselves, we're essentially doing for our gut bugs from a totality standpoint. And if we're really kind of going back to low hanging fruit, you know, if you're someone who has gut issues or really any issues, um, first is going to be the nutrition in my opinion, but a lot of other people who I've worked with, like, they're like, I'm doing the diet, I'm eating healthy, you know, I've cut all the processed foods. Why isn't my gut improving? And when we dive into it a little bit deeper, that's where we see poor sleep. That's where we see lack of sunlight. We see circadian rhythm imbalances quite a bit there too. And just like you said there, you know, our gut bugs also need sunlight, just like we do. We have this giant battery that's in the sky that most people aren't utilizing very much. And we wonder why we're chronically fatigued and tired all the time. 
And not only does that sunlight affect our gut bugs, but it also affects our quality of sleep. So there's like this whole domino effect that I see. And outside of just nutrition, I would say it's really that emotional kind of environmental piece that plays the biggest role in the development of gut issues and other health issues. You know, most of our neurotransmitters, right, are regenerated at night when we're sleeping. So this is why if you've had a poor night of sleep and you wake up the next day, you know, and just mentally you feel more fatigued, you have more cravings throughout the day. Um, you actually are lower in serotonin quite a bit there too. And most of our serotonin is produced where? In the gut, over 90% of it, the overwhelming majority. <laughs> yeah, most of our serotonin is produced in our gut. So that gives you an exact example of we have low serotonin from a poor night of sleep. We actually have more inflammation. So we see inflammatory markers increase after a poor night of sleep. And they actually, the very best thing you can do is get outside and get some sunlight and we'll start to see a lot of that, that fatigue, that inflammation and everything go down. So, you know, sunlight, I think is one of the most underutilized, you know, medications out there when it comes to gut health, mental health, you know, we just, we take it for granted so much, but it's so, so crucial for optimal health. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And it's just, it's literally that simple. Like, Go outside sometime in the morning, you know, preferably closer to sunrise and have that light hit your eyes. Don't wear sunglasses during this couple of minutes. Let the light actually hit your eyes. It helps reset your circadian rhythm. And if you can, you know, if you're in a place like, like, uh, we happen to be where it's warmer, you can even, you know, get 10 minutes of sun with your shirt off or whatever, and get that vitamin D too. We know vitamin D is super helpful for not only immune health, but actually for our brains as well. We need sunlight too. So yeah, it's free. It's available. Like you said, the battery in the sky, it's sitting up there. And even if we are in a cold climate, if we let that sunlight touch, you know, hit our, our face and our eyes and set our circadian clock, that's one of the best things we can do to help get a good night's sleep. Yes. It sounds so simple. And so, so like everybody's thinking about, oh, I got to get the aura ring or I got to do this, or I got to get these fancy sleep monitors. Like you don't need all that stuff. It's kind of yeah. fun to monitor if light. you've ever done, but <laughs> you don't actually need that. Just go outside, get some free daylight. And then at night, make it as dark as possible. Hopefully it's cool and it's not super loud and you know, all, it doesn't have a bunch of blue light coming off your devices and all that. But I mean, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other ways it affects our gut too, uh, besides with respect to the circadian rhythm and the sunlight piece is that if we can synchronize our eating with the circadian cycle, in other words, we don't eat at night or, or at least late at night, right? We shouldn't eat within a couple hours. I try to shoot for three, at least every night that I don't eat food before I go to bed three hours before bed. I have what I call a food curfew, right? And then when I first get up in the morning, I don't eat anything of caloric nature. I drink water. You know, I might have a little drop of lemon juice or something, but I don't eat calories in the morning. I think that also helps mm -hmm. sort of set that rhythm as well. Because if we think about it for millions of years, we didn't eat anything in the morning or at night. I mean, we had to work all day to find food, right? And so mm -hmm. most of the time our gut got to rest. And so I think that's critical for us nowadays as well. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I love that you mentioned that because outside of sunlight, sleep, stress, the other two areas that I really dive into quite a bit is meal timing and fasting. And what you mentioned there is something called circadian rhythm fasting. So that's essentially starting to eat when the sun comes up in the morning, sometimes even a little bit after. Um, and then when the sun goes down at night, also that's when we, we stop eating. And if we think about most people, they eat from the minute they wake up in the morning, you know, they're constantly snacking all day long because we had that terrible advice that said, you know, eat small, frequent meals throughout the day to boost your metabolism. And then, you know, half the population is overweight, obese. And, you know, tell me what is a healthy snack? I mean, yes, there's nuts <laughs> and fruits, but that's not what people are gravitating towards. They're gravitating chips. towards <laughs> chips and bars and all of these snack food items. And they're not actually eating these real whole meals that are full of uh, good quality protein and fats. I rarely see someone be like, I want a snack. I'm going to go have, you know, a piece of salmon or, you know, or something like that. You don't see that quite a bit. <laughs> so it, it's that fasting. And then it's also that meal timing. And in that fasting period, what's actually happening is we are one, giving our gut a chance to rest and heal because we have something called our body's migrating motor complex or our MMC. And these are actually cleaning waves that are sweeping bacteria, foods, and toxins to the lower part of our GI tract. 
And it's usually about at the three to four hour mark. Everybody's a little bit different that they've shown in studies, but around that mark is when we get the peak amount of the migrating motor complex activity there. So if you're snacking every one to two hours, you're actually not getting a whole lot of these cleaning waves. And most of that MMC action, of course, takes place at night because that's when we have our longest fasting period throughout the day. But on top of that migrating motor complex activity during fasting periods, we also can increase good strains of bacteria. For example, archimancia. Archimancia is a type of bacteria that I've searched forever to try to find it in a probiotic and you really can't find There's it. There's only one out there right now. There's one out there? Yeah, there is one. There is yeah. one out there. Okay. I'll have to get the, get the DL from yeah. you. Okay. That one. <laughs> only one though. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but that specific type of bacteria is actually increased during periods of extended fasting. So, you know, for most people having like a normal fast is the first place to start, you know, ha- not eating for 12 hours overnight and then having 12 hours during the day. I think having a little bit of a shorter eating window is even a bit better. So this is when we get into intermittent fasting, having an eight hour window fasting for about 16 hours every single night. And that works great because you help have you help increase your body's migrating motor complex. But during that fasting period, we also see a lot of beneficial bacteria, you know, reproduce or increase like archimancia, for example. Um, I love archimancia because it's actually been correlated with leanness. So they found, you know, going back to the studies in mice that mice who were lean compared to obese had higher levels of archimancia, you know, in their gut microbiota. So lots of benefits from fasting, from the MMC action, also from the probiotic action. And then I think just like what you said there too, with with the sunlight, Mm -hmm. you know, when we can pair it with that, it really helps our body get on a good rhythm, you know, from just a a standpoint of when our, our bowels are processing and running, because we tend to think about that you know, we're only digesting when we're eating, but that's not actually true. We're, we're always digesting and we really need those fasting periods ultimately for optimal digestion, as well as adequate sunlight in the morning, like you mentioned. Yeah, no, so, so important. And acromancy is one of my favorite gut bugs because not only does it, is it like you said, associated with leanness, but the full name of that is acromancia mucinophila, which is basically mucin loving. And so it actually increases your lining thickness. So you're less likely to get the gut permeability yeah. issues like leaky gut. You're less likely to have leaky, leaky gut. If you increase your acromancia colonies, which has been shown to come up with fasting. And the original data was on, um, some folks out in the middle East that did Ramadan that did the fasting all day, basically. And they measured their levels of acromancia and they went up with fasting. And so, yeah, acromancia is such a cool, cool gut bug. It's one of my favorites and, and it's free and simple to get it from just doing this fasting that you're talking about. You don't have to buy it from that one company that exists out there that manufactures it, but you can actually get it for free by just doing some fasting in your regimen. So <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that one of my favorite gut bugs as well. Um, is there, I, I know we're coming close to time. I respect your time here. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us kind of as parting thoughts, things that have been super helpful to move the needle for you or your clients uh, over the years, uh, in closing? I would say, you know, knowing the difference between gut healing versus gut health has been really, really essential for myself as well as my clients, you know, entering in this journey, because oftentimes I think we confuse the two. Now, gut health, I tend to describe as more of like a maintenance place, right? So this is something we should always be working on by eating real whole food, eating a diverse diet, you know, getting proper sunlight, proper eating times, fasting, trying as much as possible to not have too much stress, but we're humans who are going to experience stress and working on our gut health is going to be just really protective as a whole when it comes to longevity and metabolic health you know, really ultimately everything. Now gut healing is a little bit different. And I think people very often confuse the two. Now, when my gut was really off and I had bacteria overgrowth and my gut was inflamed and I had intestinal permeability, you know, for me working on gut health and adding in, let's say a bunch of probiotics and fermented foods and all these types of foods actually made things worse for me at that time. So gut healing, I was described as kind of like somebody who's trying to lose weight. 
It is short term. It is specific. It's also sometimes a little bit more restrictive. Um, sometimes we don't have a super diverse diet when we're trying to heal the gut because our gut is off and it's inflamed. Actually, sometimes healthy foods that are very fibrous, we don't tolerate anymore. I couldn't tolerate things like broccoli, asparagus, garlic, and onion, um, which are incredible for gut health, but were big triggers for me when I was really trying to heal my gut. So gut healing is going to be more specific. It's a very specific diet. Um, for a lot of my clients, we do something called like a low FODMAP diet, specific carbohydrate diet for some people, autoimmune protocols kind of depends a little bit on their root cause. If it's more immune mediated, if it's intestinal permeability, if it's bacteria related in their gut. Um, and that's really necessary for somebody who has, you know, some gut issues, like I, I mentioned there, autoimmune conditions, IBS, bacteria overgrowth. And I think that's where working with someone to figure out more of a customized diet is super essential. Sometimes even, you know, some testing. Um, when I went to the doctor, we just did very basic testing. No one was really talking a whole lot about the gut microbiome. And a lot of what I do with my practice is we do that gut microbiome testing. So we can look for bacteria overgrowth, pathogens, parasites, intestinal permeability, immune issues, um, and really identify a lot of that root cause along with looking at somebody's nutrition, looking at their stress, their supplements, their medications to go along with it and develop a healing plan. But healing is not something we want to stay in forever. It's short term and specific to get to a place where we can then enter into gut health, which gut health is more of that maintenance place. Um, gut health is where we, like I said, want to eat as much diverse fruits and vegetables as possible, take all the probiotics, the prebiotics, the polyphenols. Um, and that's something we can do long term. So gut health is more of that lifestyle that we're trying to aim for. And I explain those two because, you know, I know for me at the beginning, I went immediately to work on the gut health side of everything. And that's where everything got worse. So, you know, for anybody who's listening, you know, ask yourself, you know, if you're somebody who has actual gut issues, um, an autoimmune condition, you may actually need to focus a little bit more on gut healing because there could be some of that intestinal permeability bacteria overgrowth that's happening there. Um, but eventually the goal is always to enter into gut health. So anybody, you know, who's just like, I want to improve my health. Um, I want to feel better. I want to look better. I want to improve my mental health. Who doesn't have any like major, major gut issues. I'd say gut health is a perfect place to start from then. Yeah, no, that's actually really, really important that you shared that because I think a lot of people, they hear one thing and they just want to like, okay, I'm going to go do that right now. But you got to go with where you are because everybody's in a different place. There's no one size fits all at the moment. You know, you may be in a different place in your healing journey, or maybe you're on the maintenance part of it. And so that's actually, I'm really glad you mentioned that because there's so many nuances to that. And in the beginning, if you need to do the healing first, you're probably going to need some sort of specified diet, either an elimination diet or the, you know, you mentioned a few of them, the specific carbohydrate diet, the autoimmune protocol, you know, there's so many different ones, but in the beginning, yeah. you may need to actually limit what you're eating and get rid of a bunch of stuff just to kind of reset, reset the process. You know, we, we talk about this a lot, my wife and I, with, when you're starting a new thing, sometimes you need to kind of reset first. You, before you add in all the maintenance stuff, like the probiotics, the prebiotics, the polyphenols and whatnot, you got to have a little bit of a kind of reset phase. And so, so important to, to kind of separate the healing part versus the maintenance part, which is more the gut health. And you, you did that really eloquently. So thank you so much for that. How, how can our listeners and viewers uh, hear more of you? Where can they follow you? Where can they get your help? Um, tell us all about where people can find you. Yeah, I have a podcast that I post an episode on every single week. I bring on incredible people just like yourself to nerd out with me all on, you know, mental health, gut health, entrepreneurship, just any way you can really heal and optimize your body. Um, because I'm a big believer of, you know, when we get this right, everything else truly begins to fall into place. We can love people more. We can create the way we want to create. We can serve other people more. But if this isn't right, you know, it's going to be really hard to create the life that we want to ultimately have for ourselves. So um, I bring on incredible people, interview them every single week. You can check out Sheer Madness on iTunes or Spotify. 
Um, and then you can check out my practice at rachelshear.com. This is where we do a lot of the uh, functional medicine testing, identifying the root cause. I have my team of registered dietitians where we really customize your plan and protocols, whether that's on the healing side or the optimization side. We work with a broad range of clients there to just meet their health needs. And then you can find me on social media at Rachel Shear on Instagram. Yeah. And at Rachel Shear Nutrition as well. She's got the separate yeah, handle. At Rachel as Shear well. Nutrition is my practice on Instagram. Awesome. Well, we'll have all that in the show notes and whatnot. But it's been such a gift to have you on the show today, Rachel. Really appreciate you and all that you're doing. It's it's been wonderful. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you so much for having me on. And we'll have to bring you on my show here sometime soon. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I would love to do that. Thanks again. And big aloha to Rachel. What an amazing gift. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss out on any future episode. And I'd love to hear your comments and feedback. If there's any topic you'd love to hear about, you're dying to know, burning questions, please comment below and let me know what future topics are of interest to you.